Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host for this episode. And we just saw the... I don't actually know what round it was, but race 19 and 20 of the V8 Supercars at Ipswich, Queensland Raceway, the classic circuit. Uh, They've been going there for over 20 years, I think, um, since the late 90s. So, um, and let's just uh, get right into the race results because neither of the races were super exciting in terms of action, but we did get a few things to talk about. So we'll go straight into qualifying for race 19 and we'll go right down the results. In first place, Scott McLaughlin, not a surprise. He is good at qualifying. (laughs) What can I say? The guy knows what he's doing. Um, He, they passed off, I think some, uh, the commentators mentioned some stat um, over the weekend, I think it was on Saturday, where they said that he is now equaled um, and he would have surpassed with the Sunday qualifying as well, so spoilers, <laughs> um, that he um, has surpassed Mark Scaife with total number of co- career pole positions at something like, I think, 41 or something like that is what they said, which is ridiculous. Mark Scaife raced for over 20 years. He's a fi- He was a five-time champion, I'm pretty sure. One of the most successful V8 supercar drivers of all time, or ATCC drivers, as it was before the V8 supercars. Scott's been racing for five years, I think, in in the V8 supercars championship. I think it's five years, 2013 or 2014 he started. Maybe 2012, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and he's already surpassed Mark Scaife for polls. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, the guy should give himself a real pat in the back. I don't know how he does it. Um, yeah, anyway, apart, apart from that uh, wizardry, um, we've got the real talking point, the real thing I wanted to talk about, Chaz Mostert in second. Chaz, a Tickford car, in the t- not only in the top 10, but in the top three. We- I haven't seen that all year. Um and as you can see from the race results and the qualifying results and everything, all weekend he has been consistent, but it's only been Chaz, as we'll get to. So Tickford might be coming back. Um, hope so, but we'll see. Uh, Fabian Coulthard in third, not a bad result from him. David Reynolds in fourth. Rick Kelly in fifth. Jamie Winkup in sixth. Michael Caruso in seventh. Shane Van Gisbergen in eighth. And uh, we'll discuss why that happened, or why he's so far down. It also involves Chaz Mostert, so... Um, Nick Perkat in ninth, Craig Lowndes in 10th for your top 10, with the top 10 car separated by half a second. McLaughlin scoring a 108.50, and Craig Lowndes scoring a 109 flat. So, close qualifying. But it gets closer because Garth Tander's in 11th. Good to see him back up the order again. Um, I know they mentioned uh, Garth's been, Garth has been looking kind of frustrated with his um, Gary Rogers car, and I can't blame him. He hasn't had the most competitive car, so it is, has been nice to see him sort of up there a bit more again. Um, we know he's a good driver. He is a champion. Um, he really deserves a little bit more out of that car. Unfortunately, Gary Rogers just not as good as they used to be as le- uh, lately, but that's okay because... Another team that's been struggling lately, James Courtney in 12th position. Um, and as we'll see over the rest of these results for the weekend, uh, Walkinshaw and Andretti not doing well. Not doing well this weekend. Um, I don't know what to say. Um, they've both had problems. Um, I think this is kind of cementing, though, which driver is the better one out of the two of them because... Uh, as we'll get to, James Corney has consistently been scoring better um, or been more consistent, I suppose, than Scott Pye in the same car. And there's been, I think, two weekends in a row where James has been much further up, even competitive. And then Scott Pye has been way in the back. Um, I don't know if it's just because um, James has better qualifying. I don't know if he's a 
I don't know if it's a McLaughlin and Coulthard situation where McLaughlin's just a wizard at qualifying and Courtney's just better at qualifying than Scott Pye. I don't know. But um, the results kind of speak for themselves. Will Davison in 13th, the next of the Tickford branded Fords. Um, so you can see how that's sort of panned out. Chaz is all, all on his own up the front there. Uh, followed by Richie Stanaway. He is the next of the actual Tickford team cars. Um, so Chaz Most at second, Richie Sunaway 14th. I think that's one of his best qualifying results too. So good on him. Um, I've been sort of secretly going for Richie Stanaway. I know he's had a really tough season, really tough. Um, I think he's a good driver. I really do. I hope he pulls back. Um, I hope he, he does, he does a better, he, I hope he gets a better car. That's what I'm trying to say. Get the words out. Um, I hope he's. I hope they give him a better car. I hope he gets into a better team. Whatever the case, I think he's got a lot to do. I think he can prove himself. I think he's got a lot in him. Um, he reminds me a lot of when um, Shane Van Gisbergen and Scott McLaughlin entered the championship. Maybe less so Scott McLaughlin because he was sort of an instant hit, but um, a lot like um, Shane, where he's sort of in a midfield team for a long time, but did things like fought with top drivers on, on occasion and really showed his stuff. And Richie's doing that. Richie's doing that. He doesn't quite have the car pace there. I reckon if he gets put in a good car, though, he could really show his stuff. And I'm sort of go- secretly going for him. Um, Tim Slade in 15th, Simona in 16th, Heimgartner in 17th, Scott Pye in 18th. That's where he ended up. Um, James Golding in 19th, the second of the rookies, uh, Rich Stanaway being the first, so good on both of them. Mark Winterbottom in 20th, the next full-time uh, experienced Tickford racing car, a full 700th of a second behind Chas Moster in pace. Um, not good. I know that Chaz had a good weekend. Uh, Winterbottom and Cameron Waters in 21st. He qualified in 21st. Not a good weekend. Um, I don't understand how, <laughs> especially since officially Mark Winterbottom, uh, Winterbottom and Mostert are on the same team and Waters and Stanaway are on the other team. So Stanaway and Mostert seem to have gotten a better car and Winterbottom and Waters seem to have a worse car than uh, last than last round. I don't understand how. I don't know what's happening in that garage, but I think it's sort of a case of they're throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks. And whatever they threw at the wall for Mostert stuck well. And uh, whatever threw at the wall for Winterbottom and Waters did not pan out for them at all. Um, De Pasquale in 22nd. Jack LeBrock in 23rd. Todd Hazelwood in 24th. Holdsworth in 25th. Blanchard in 26th. And the wild card entry for this round, Kurt Kostecki from Dunlop Super 2. Actually, I don't think it's called Dunlop anymore. I think it's just called Super 2. Uh, from the development series, racing for his first, uh, maybe not his first, but a, a, a proper round in the Viet Supercars, um, a full 200 tenths of a second out from Tim Blanchard. So there you go. Um, overall, between the whole field, not including Kirk Kostecki, because um, he's new, Um just over a second separating all the drivers with Kurt Kostecki being 1.2 1, 1. seconds out. Um, so another close field. Another close, close field. So we're going to the race. Race 19. The winner. Um, actually, no. Before we go into the race, I wanted to talk about Chaz. So um, Chaz Mostert. Um, yeah, so Chaz Mostert. Had a, and Shane Van Gisbergen had a little bit of a... <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure what happened between them. Um, so, if you didn't see the race um, during... Quali- or, not the race, the qualifying. Um, Shane was on his first flying lap. I think it was... Yeah, he went out a bit later after everybody. and went on his first lap a bit after everybody else. So, there are a lot of people on their in-lap going a bit slow. Um, it wasn't a problem until he came up to the last corner and he approached the back of Chaz Mostert. Um... I guess someone in Tickford didn't know that Shane was on a flying lap and just didn't tell Mostert because Mostert was going slow on the racing line preparing to go into pit lane. Um, And uh, Shane very nearly had an accident with him. He had to dodge around him to the right. Um, He wouldn't have had an accident with him. I'm not going to lie. He wasn't going to have an accident with him. It wasn't a close call thing, but it did ruin his lap. He had to move around to the right, completely abandon the racing line, completely abandon the lap. He lost about two to five tenths off his last sector, and as a result, he put in an abysmal time. Um, he wasn't even in the top ten for his first time, 
So he would have, if he had not improved upon that time, he would have been down in um, 15th, 16th. But if he had imp- if he had gotten the time that he was set to get, he might have been further up than what he is now. Um, so it seemed, seemed like a pretty blatant um, call for a penalty. Um, like that's the sort of thing that you just don't, you don't do it. Um, you can't just, you know, you can't just sit on the racing line while someone's on a flying lap behind you. That's just not how it works. Um, and he was penalized. Um, whether or not he was penalized enough, um, is up to you to decide, I suppose, because he was given, he was given a three grid drop place penalty. Um... For his um, for his efforts, um, and I so he went from second to fifth when he started the when he started, so he started in second. Um, sorry, he qualified in second, and then he started the actual grid in fifth position, just ahead of Jamie Winkup. Um, I personally don't think that three is enough. I think five would have been better. Um, because he really he ruined his lap and it could have been dangerous like yeah he yeah Shane had lots of time to get around him because he saw him on the back on the end on the last straight so the last straight before the last corner um he could see him the whole way up there he knew he was there um he wasn't ever going to run into the back of him unless you know unless there was some kind of in, in, in crazy circumstance um but like had he like you know what if he'd gotten coming around the corner you know, what if uh, the corner beforehand, um, Chaz was going slow on the on the racing line and Shane came around the apex and just ran straight into the back of him, you know what I mean? Um, so, yes, it wasn't dangerous the way it was, but it could have been. Um, and he did deserve the penalty, he got the penalty, um, and it's arguable whether or not the lap that Shane was on would have been better than the one he eventually got. You could argue all day about that. Um, but the end result is that Chaz started in fifth when he should have when he qualified in second, and Shane qualified in eighth when he could have potentially qualified higher. Um, and yeah, I mean these sort of things are just dangerous. I think five places would have been better because that would have put him into seventh. So still not overly harsh, um, and only one position above Shane. So um, Shane still not gaining up on anything. He's still Shane not still not getting anything out of it. Um, but Chaz losing quite a bit, and that's the sort of thing that needs to be clamped down on. You can't have drivers traveling around the track slowly on the racing line while people are trying to commit a flying lap. That's how you get accidents. That's why we've got the new, um, not just any accident, but really dangerous accidents, um, and people just spearing into the back of each other. Um, that's why we've got the new um, system for qualifying on the shorter tracks where the, fir- the fastest people from practice three go straight through to qualifying two, and it's elimination style like in Formula One because they want to eliminate these types of problems with cars being on the track driving slowly while other cars are trying to drive quickly. And this isn't... I don't know. I don't know. I think it's too lenient. Let me know what you think. Um, feel free to leave a comment if you want. Um, was it too lenient? Was it not lenient? Was it, uh, was it too lenient? Um, was it too harsh? Maybe you thought he didn't deserve a penalty at all. That's all fine. Um, I personally think that he deserved a little bit more, um, but otherwise, a three grid drop place penalty isn't too bad. You know, um, it still sucks for Chaz. So, and I'm sure it wasn't his fault. Someone in the team just didn't tell him what was going on. Um, so that's always unfortunate to see. But enough of that. End of the race. Um, so, winner Scott McLaughlin. Um, he sort of just sort of led the whole race um, as usual, but. Shane in second place. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, for those of you who didn't see, or if you did see, Shane got the best start I think I've ever seen in V8 Supercars. I don't think I've seen a better start than the one Shane got. Um, there could be some, but honestly, it's one of the best starts I've seen in motorsport, period. He started in eighth position, and by the end of the first lap, he was into fourth. By the end of the first corner, sorry, he was into fourth, and the end of the first lap, he was into third. Um, Ridiculous start. You can watch a replay online if you want, but he completely vaults everybody off the starting line. Absolutely everybody. Um, So, I mean, you know, great start from him. 
Um, and Craig Lowndes in third, moving up seven positions. So another good job. Um, uh, Red Bull, two Red Bulls on the podium. So they'll be happy with that. Jamie Winkup in fourth. Um, he didn't have the greatest weekend, to be honest. He didn't do terribly, of course, but he didn't have the most fantastic weekend he could have had. Coulthard in fifth. Moster in sixth. Reynolds in seventh. James Courtney up four spots to eighth. Good job to him. Uh, Caruso in ninth. Perka in tenth. Tanda in eleventh. Stanaway up two spots to twelfth. Good on you, Stanaway. Rick Kelly down nine spots to thirteen. Um, he just had a really bad pit stop. Um, I think they were talking about it um, at the time. And, um, yeah, I've just written down bad pit stop. He's just got, he just, he went into the pits and he just, I think, because this was a non-fuel race, um, they didn't put any fuel in, but they completely muffed up one of his tires and he ended up, I think he ended up sitting in pits for nine seconds or something like that. Something ridiculous. Um, and he lost a ton of spots. Otherwise, he would have been up there. I think he went in at the same time as... Um, I don't know. I think... I want to say Wink Up. Wink Up was behind him for a lot of the race. So, yeah, I want to say Wink Up was uh, who he went behind. And he ended up so many positions down from Wink Up. So, yeah, that's very unfortunate to see. For him, um, the Nissan's just not... I mean, Caruso dropped some spots and Rick Kelly dropped a lot of spots and it just seemed like... Um, it just seems like the Nissans have qualifying pace, but they don't quite have race pace yet. Um, so, that'll be something for them to work on over the um, over the coming weeks. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say. They clearly have qualifying pace now. Kelly's up there every, every qualifying. Caruso's in the top 10 almost every qualifying. Heimgartner's brushing the top 10 every qualifying. Um, but they drop in their race results every time they drop. They never maintain their position. They never increase their position. They drop. Um, so I think their race pace is leaving a bit to be wanting. That's okay. All things to work on. Tim Slade in 14th. Heimgartner in 15th, up two spots. Pi in 16th, up two spots. Davison down four into 17th. James Golding, good job from him. Um, the second of the rookies, again, up one spot. Stand away being the first, of course. Um, Simona down three spots into 19th. Winterbottom in 20th. LeBrock, 21st. Cameron Waters, 22nd. Blanchard, 23rd. Holdsworth, 24th. Kurt Kostecki, not in last, 25th. Uh, De Pasquale in 26, he had a um, unsafe release during his pit stop. They didn't put his tire on properly. Um, so they had to bring him back and put another tire on him. Obviously cost him a lot of time and he was penalized for it, I believe. Um, I'm not sure actually, but he definitely had an unsafe release. I'm not sure if he was penalized in the end. It probably was fined or something. Um, and Hazelwood, um, not a great weekend for him. Don't remember what happened to him actually in that race. Um, ah, he had a battery issue. So, Todd Hazelwood uh, had a problem with his battery, if you can believe it, and his car, they had to bring him in to fix it. He was still classified, no DNF for him, so everyone got points. Um, but um, that was the race for everybody, and Hazelwood having a bad weekend, he's still got his shoulder, still got his shoulder from um, last round. So, um, for those of you that don't know, at Townsville, Todd Hazelwood uh, dislocated his shoulder in race one at Townsville. And at race two, he um, was racing through a lot of pain. He's still got a bad shoulder. So don't expect him to, um, if you're a fan of Todd Hazelwood, don't expect him to be doing too great for a little bit. He's still recovering. Um, good on him, though, to get out there every weekend and just just score some points. Just see how he does because he must be hurting. He must be hurting. Um, I know his shoulder's all strapped up. Um, so as for what actually happened in the race, um, yeah, as I said, Gisbergen got a fantastic start, as did Rick Kelly and Mostert. They gained quite a few positions at the start. Um, Winker pushed Mostert off the road right at the start as well, um, made him lose a few positions. This is at the start of the race. No penalty was given. Um, Mostert, um, so yes, the real story was the undercutting strategies that happened. For those of you that didn't, that don't know, an undercut is when you come into the pits earlier than another driver, put on fresher tires, and overall go faster, so that when the next, 
when your rivals do come in, you've been going faster than them because you've been on fresher rubber. Um, Mostert came in very early. I think it was lap nine of 39 or something for a, and he put on, put on two sets of tires, um, uh, two tires, sorry. One, I think they were both on the left from what I remember. Um, and he was in, he was pretty far back at the time because Winkup pushed him off the road. I think he was at the back of the top 10 when he pitted. Um, I want to say eighth or ninth. He came in really early, and um, by the time the next driver came in, which I think was Scott McLaughlin, um, maybe lap 15, 16, 17 for Scott, 14, 15, 16, something like that, um, Mostert actually um, almost vaulted him in the pits, so he got an incredible undercut, absolutely incredible undercut on him. Um, uh, Lowndes came in and came out, um, behind McLaughlin, that was one of the reasons why he was so far up. He got, he also got the undercut, the same undercut that Mostert benefited from. Um, he didn't go in as ridiculously early as Mostert did, did, though, and he also changed all four tires, unlike Mostert. So I think that's why his tire life lasted him a bit longer, and he was able to hold on to third until the end of the race. Um, um, I think that's all. I mean. Um, it wasn't too interesting of a race. Nothing huge to talk about. A Queensland Raceway. Um, not really my favourite track. It's really simple. Um, and there's no real opportunities. I mean, there's lots of opportunities for overtaking. Um, three, actually. <laughs> there's three opportunities for overtaking, really. Um, but um, it's just a simple track. Um, they call it the paperclip, and there's a reason for that. It just It doesn't... It's not... You know, it's not the most interesting of tracks to look at. It's not the most interesting interesting of tracks to um, strategize for, at least in terms of a racer. When you're racing around the track, you know, you're thinking about when you can overtake, where you can overtake. Um, there isn't that much of it in this track. There's not that much challenge, I think, to driving around the track. I know I'm not a driver, so I could just be completely talking out of my ass, but... Um, you know, it's a simple track. It's one of the most simple tracks on the calendar. Six corners. So, um, it's not my favorite. If you are a fan, that's fine. You know, it produces some good racing. And it has produced some good racing. Um, I just don't think it's the most interesting of tracks. Um, and that's kind of reflected today or this weekend. Um, I don't think we had very interesting races in terms of track position. But that's okay. Still plenty to watch. Still plenty to see. Still plenty to talk about and as we are talking we'll go into the second qualifying session so qualifying for race 20 scott mclaughlin he improved upon his time 108.48 and i mean i don't think i need to say i'll probably just skip who who qualified first and go straight to second because scott always gets first you know um shane in second with a 108.5 so really close together um nice to see shane back up there and chaz Moster in third, this time with no penalty to drop him down. And honest to God, Tickford Carr in the top three on the grid. Really good to see. Excellent work from their team to finally bring that car up to snuff. Finally, let's hope when they go into the next round that it isn't, uh, that it hasn't just been a, um, a fluke um, for this track. Like, let's hope when they go to the next track that, you know, they are actually fast again. Like, it's been a long time. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen a Tickford car even get a podium. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. And it's just, we, it's been a bit of a two horse race, really. So it'd be nice to see another team come back into it a little bit more. Um, Coulthard in fourth, another good qualifying session from him. Reynolds in fifth, Kelly in sixth, Winkup in seventh, not doing so great lately. Uh, Lowndes in eighth, Caruso in ninth, Stanaway in tenth, the first of the rookies. Good job to Richie Stanaway. Um, only 0.3 of a second off McLaughlin's time, so he was within the same uh, second, a 108.8. Excellent job from him. Excellent job. Um... Yeah, I've been impressed with Stanaway and his, and his ability. I think he lacks a little bit of racecraft in the V8 supercars. I think he's not used to the 
um, I'm not sure what how to describe it, but maybe the more physical nature of it, where there's a lot of um, pushing and shoving, I guess, in V8 supercars as opposed to um, other sport uh, motorsports where it's very it's things like wheel to wheel, wheel to wheel racing, open wheelers. You can't you can't shove other people, <laughs> or you just crash. Um, there's a lot of shoving in V8 supercars. I think he might be a bit less used to that, and his racing suffers a little bit as a result. But he is good at qualifying. Um, at least at this track. And he's never been here before, as far as I know. I think this is his first time here. Um, so, yeah, Tickford doing a good job with Mostert and Stanaway's cars. Tanda in 11th, LeBrock in 12th. Good job from him as well. Davison in 13th, Heim, the Heimgartner, sorry, I'll get it out, in 14th. Waters in 15th, Winterbottom in 16th. A little bit better than yesterday. Not where they should be, though. Needs to be doing better than that. I know, we know Waters and Winterbottom are good drivers. Winterbottom is a champion. He shouldn't be that far down. He just shouldn't. Um, Simona in 17th, Courtney in 18th, and Slade in 19th, and Pi in 20th. Um, I don't know what's going on at Walkinshaw Andretti, but it's not good. Um, they had, I think, very similar qualifying in um, Townsville. They did better on the second race. So they were both in the top 10 shootout. But, um, yeah, 18th and 20th in qualifying. And I think 12th and 18th, I think, um, for Saturday. Not good results. Not good results at all. Um there's just something needs to be looked at there. Someone needs to take a look, good, long, hard look at those cars and figure out what's wrong with them. Um, Holdsworth in 21st, Golding in 22nd, Deeper Squally in 23rd, Hazelwood in 24th, Perka in 25th, Kurt Kostecki being slightly faster than Tim Blanchard in uh, 27th. So, uh, overall, separated by just over a tiny amount of uh, one second between first and last. Another good, close qualifying session, just like we want to see. Um, and uh, nothing nothing super eventful happened in qualifying, so we'll move straight into race 20 with Shane Van Gisbergen winning the race with another fantastic start, um, just like he did on Saturday. Completely vaulted around Scott and just stayed there. He just stayed there the whole race, commanded it. Um it looked a bit close in the first few laps. It looked a bit close. Scott looked like he was very threatening um, for a long time. Um, but eventually backed off. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what happened. Um, Scott McLaughlin ended up taking the undercut option in the pits and pitted very early for his first stop, put in a very small amount of fuel, and um, along with Chaz Mostert. And they ended up being the front runners for the mid portion of the race before the second pit stop and then once the second pit stop came around um Shane Van Gisbergen vaulted back over them again and ended up winning the race quite comfortably um if you were watching the race if you're a Scott McLaughlin fan or even a Gisbergen fan and you were watching the race and you were wondering why at the end of the after Shane came out of the pits um he was so much slower than Scott why Scott and Mostert were able to um um, McLaughlin, sorry, and Mostert were able to catch up to the back of Gisbergen very easily and sort of threaten him for a while. Um, uh, what happened was that Mostert used up all of his tires to... Um, he used up... He raced really aggressively to get to the back of McLaughlin, and you could see that when he um, fell off again um, just after he caught up. So he used up all of his racing. He used up all of his tires trying to get back to McLaughlin. Um, and he said in an interview afterwards that he just wanted to see how hard he could push the car. Um, so, he, admirable. Uh, he almost ended up losing third because <laughs> he almost ended up losing third um, to Jamie Winkup because he lost all his tyres to that. But um, still nice to see some racing. Um, Mick Loughlin, uh, I don't think he lost his tyres, but um, what I think was happening was that Gisbergen... Um, was told to just take it easy, conserve his tyres in case there's a safety car, just relax and control the race. Um, I don't think his engineers really thought he would let them get that close because that's like, if you make a mistake, they're going to get past you sort of thing. Um, that's running it a bit close than you need to because um, Scott, Scott was 0.2 of a second away um, for quite a few laps. It looked very, he was very threatening for a long time. 
Um, but eventually, um, Shane ended up just pulling away, and he ended up finishing um, over two seconds in front. So I think um, all he was doing was conserving, waiting. Um, he let them get closer to him, and then he just pulled away again towards the end, and Scott didn't have an answer for it. Um, but yeah, that's the real news this week. Chaz Mostert, third place, a podium for Tickford, their first one this year. Um, you know, what can you say? I think Tickford have, are bringing it back again. They've finally found some pace. Nice to see. We know Chaz is a good driver. We know he is. Um, this is where he deserves to be. Um, not down in fifth deep, you know, not languishing at the back. He needs to be up here fighting in the top 10, getting those podiums, getting those wins. That's what we want to see. Um, we want to see more than just this two-horse race that's been going on. Um, it's really been um, Red Bull and Shell. Um, uh, yeah, Holden Racing Team versus um, DJ Penske. That's all it's been. We need more. And hopefully, Mostert at least, at least this weekend... He brought a little bit more and drove a big wedge between um, the Red Bull cars and the DJR cars. Because Jamie Winkup was in fourth, he nearly got around Mostert in the last lap. I think if there had been one more lap, uh, Winkup would have gotten would have gotten past and gotten a third posi- position. Yeah, sorry, position. Um, but good on Mostert for holding him off. Good racing there at the end. Coulthard in fifth, Slade in sixth, up 13 positions. <laughs> An incredible amount. Absolutely ridiculous amount of positions to come up. He started in 19th and he ended up in sixth. Um, I didn't really notice what happened to him during the race, to be honest. Um, he just kind of just kind of vaulted past him. I don't really... <laughs> I mean, he just kind of vaulted past everybody in the pits. I don't really know. Um, I don't really... Like, they didn't really focus on him until the end. Um, I don't really notice him pulling up through the f- pulling up through the field. Sorry, so I'm not really sure what he did to be that good. Um, I don't know if he was passing everybody or if he just had good strategy or both. Um, but good job to him. Good job to Bradley Jones Racing. Um, they deserve that, um, and that's good to see Tim Slade. He's a good driver as well. I think he can do better if he was in a good team, a better team. Sorry, um, I think he could be. I think he could be fighting. Maybe. Maybe for championships, you know? Like, I think he's a good driver. He was on the same team as Shane Van Gisbergen for a long time. Um, Stone Brothers Racing. And they both did relatively well together. I don't think either of them... I don't think Shane was totally eclipsing Tim at all. Um, so it's good to see a good result from him. David Reynolds in 7th. Craig Lowndes in 8th. Rick Kelly in ninth, dropping a few positions. Jack LeBrock, the first of the rookies in 10th. Good result from him, capitalizing on some... Um, some uh, carnage between Rick Kelly and Garth Tander to get around Garth Tander, who finished in 11th. Will Davison in 12th. Caruso in 13th, dropping a few spots. Heimgartner in 14th. Golding up seven positions into 15th. And Di Pasquale also up seven positions into 16th. Cameron Waters in 17th, the next of the Tickford cars. So, f- 14 positions down from the first Tickford car is Cameron Waters. That is an awful conversion rate. Awful. That's not consistent at all between cars. Um, Stanaway in 18th. I don't really know what happened to Stanaway. He was... <laughs> he was he was doing well. He started in 10th, and he seemed to be doing well in the middle part of the race as well. He was up there with um, with um, Rick Kelly, Garth Tander, Craig Lowndes. He was in there with everybody on the, at the back end of the top 10. He just kind of stayed there all race. And then right at the end, I just sort of noticed that he was right at the back and I didn't really know why. Um, I'm not sure if there, something went wrong in his pit stop or um, if their strategy just didn't work out. But something went wrong and I don't think it was his fault. I didn't see him go off the track. I didn't see any driver errors. So something happened. Um, which is unfortunate for him. It was nice to see him all the way up the top. I think he can do better than 18th for sure. Um, maybe a high top 10 finish for Richie Stanaway before the end of the season would be great to see. Um, Scott Pye in 19th. Simona in 20th. Bit of a frustrating race for her. Uh, Holdsworth in 21st. Blanchard in 22nd. Kostecki in 23rd. Hazelwood in 24th. Nick Perkat in 25th. And one lap down with a very early puncture. Um, on lap three, caused by Di Pasquale. I think it was just a racing incident. No one was penalized. 
Um, and yeah, in the end of lap three, um, or start of lap three, Percat just went flying off the course with a puncture, had to come in, get it changed. Um, so he went down a lap as a result, which is unfortunate because um, Percat's a good racer. Again, he's a Bathurst winner. Um, you know, he's good. I like him. So he's a good racer. Um, shame to see him down. Normally he's up in the top 10, duking it out with everybody else. Um, uh, Mark Winterbottom in 26, uh, four laps down. And James Courtney not classified um, due to some issues between the Walkinshaw Andretti cars and Mark Winterbottom. Um, if you didn't see the race, uh, on lap one, um, James was pushed wide after... Was pushed wide, sorry. Um, Courtney was pushed wide out of turn three and went onto the grass and Scott Pye behind him decided to go up the inside. At the same time, Courtney went up the inside of Mark Winterbottom into the next corner, so turn four, um, and there just clearly wasn't enough room. Um, Scott went into the side of Courtney, and Courtney went into the side of Mark Winterbottom. Um, Winterbottom's, I believe, suspension broke um, because of the court damage from Courtney, and Courtney also sustained pretty heavy damage and had to, and both Winterbottom and Courtney had to go into the pits for repairs, and Pi was fine. Um, yeah, not good. It's not good when you have um, a tussle with your teammate like that. Um, they won't be happy in that garage at all, especially since Scott didn't, wasn't exactly vying for a, he- a high position. Um, it honestly looked like just a racing incident to me. I don't think anyone was particularly at fault. Yeah, Scott probably didn't have to go up the inside of Courtney, but, I mean, Courtney made a mistake and he was just capitalizing on it. Um, this is the sort of thing that happens at the start of the race, you know? Um, it's just it's just what happens when you're in the middle of the pack at the start of the race. It's it's dangerous to be there. That's why it's good to qualify at the front. Um, yeah, it's not a safe place to be. And this is an example of what can happen between even really experienced, to dri- uh, really experienced drivers like Courtney and Winterbottom um, and even Pi, he's, he's been in there for a while now. Um, these are the sorts of things that can go wrong. Um, this is why you don't want to be there. So, good on Mark Winterbottom and Tickford Racing for getting his car out there for the necessary laps. Um, unfortunate to see Courtney not classified. Um, they got him out again, and then he brought him back in again um, before the end of the race. And he only finished 24 laps. Not enough to be class- classified. Need to finish 75% of the race to be classified. Um, so no points for him, but no safety cars, no incidents, just a few mechanical issues for some of the people at the back of the grid. Um, the only other thing to talk about in the race, uh, Reynolds had an absolutely awful start. Uh, one of the reasons why he's down two positions at the end of the race is because he had an awful start at the start of the race. He got absolutely vaulted by everybody. Um... Um, Kostecki spun Blanchard at, um, on lap 31. He just spun him around on the last corner, I believe. Um, Blanchard finished in 22nd and Kostecki in 23rd. And Kostecki made up three spots and was given a 15-second penalty for spinning Blanchard. Um, I'm not sure I agree with 15 seconds. I think that's a little bit severe. Um, I think the reason why he was given 15 seconds, though, I can't remember if it was done retroactively. Actually, no, I don't think it was. I think it was done on the spot. So, yeah, a bit severe. He ended up being behind... He ended up finishing behind Blanchard anyway with the penalty. Um, He finished in an hour... An hour, 19 minutes and 36 seconds, whereas Blanchard finished in an hour, 19 and 34 seconds. And without the 15-second penalty, um, he would have finished a lot higher. Much higher. Within the top 20, I think. Yeah, I think he would have been above um, Simona. So, um, I think that's a bit harsh. I think 15 seconds is a little much. He didn't, yeah, it was a bad move and he shouldn't have done it and he spun Blanchard around. Um, but 10 seconds, you know, 15 seconds, it wasn't a major incident. He just made a mistake. So I think 10 seconds probably would have sufficed, but 15 seconds isn't unreasonable either. I think it's just a little bit in the harsh side, especially for a new driver. Um, so what do you know? But the real story the real story is um, Shane Van Gisbergen getting through Coulthard and Mostert through the second stint. Um, if you didn't see the race, um, if you did, you know what I'm talking about, but if you didn't see the race, um, after Shane came out of the pits, he put on more fuel 
and he came in later than Coulthard, Moster, and McLaughlin ended up coming out behind them, um, inevitably. Um, because he was running a different strategy, though, and he had much fresher tyres, he was going a lot faster than they were, more than a second a lap. So he caught up to the back of Coulthard really quickly, um, and before the last corner, Coulthard puts his right indicator on to tell Gisbergen that he's going to let him through around the last corner. He, no contest, he's just going to let him through. Um... At first, I thought that this was fine, um, but I didn't, it made sense to me. He, Coulthard knew that Gisbergen had better tyres, more fuel, and he wasn't going to be able to fight with Gisbergen to get... He, Gisbergen would have got around him. Um, uh, I thought it was fine until um, it was very brightly pointed out to me that if Coulthard, Coulthard's teammates with McLaughlin and Gisbergen's fighting for position with McLaughlin at the moment, he needs to get back through that field as quickly as possible so that he can get back in front of McLaughlin for the next pits. He had about five seconds in hand with the extra fuel that he took on versus McLaughlin. So he needed to be within five seconds of him before he pitted, and he wasn't um, when Coulthard let him through. Um, what could have happened is that Coulthard could have held him up for the sake of his teammate, if only for a lap or if only for a couple of corners. Um, but everything can count. This is racing. Um... And instead of doing anything that might benefit his teammate, Coulthard just let him through for the sake of basically his own race. Um, I'm not sure if anyone in the team would have told him to, what to do. I'd be really surprised if anyone told him to let Gisbergen through or if Coulthard just didn't want to deal with it. Um, he knew Gisbergen was faster. And like I said, initially, I didn't think it was that strange. I didn't blame him. It's only the fact that his teammates with, Le with McLaughlin that hazes the water a bit because, yeah, he could have he could have done some damage to Gisbergen. He could have stopped Gisbergen from winning. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, had in another even in another world had Coulthard, um, had Coulthard tried to fight with Gisbergen even for half a lap. Um, it might have been enough for Gisbergen to not be able to get back in front of McLaughlin after the next pit stop, and McLaughlin could have won the race, you know, it was it was pretty close towards the end there, um, he only got out, I think Gisbergen came out with one and a half seconds in hand in front of McLaughlin, so if Coulthard had held him up, if Gisbergen had been held up for just, just a second longer, um, it would have been much, much closer, you know, it could have been the difference between a race win and a second place. Um, so I'm not very... I don't. I really don't know how to feel about it. Um, on one hand, I think Coulthard did the right thing by himself. Um, if he was only thinking of himself and his race, it makes a lot more sense for him to let Gisbergen through. Coulthard doesn't have the tyre life. Gisbergen's on a different strategy. He knows he's going to get by him in the pit stop. So he thinks, might as well just let him through, continue on with my race, keep, keep care, uh, take care of my tyres, make sure that my race is going to go okay, and I'll just let him do his thing. Um, but in terms of being a team, Coulthard could have done a lot of damage to Gisbergen's race, um, and this sort of thing's important for the championship. I know it's a little early to be talking about championship fights and team orders and things like that, but... We're getting to that part of the season. We're almost into endurance season. Um, so it's something that needs to be thought about now. Um, it's a really interesting decision. Uh, Moster also let Gisbergen through. But as I, like I said before, it makes sense as an individual to let, um, to let the faster car go by because you don't want to waste your tires. You don't want to waste your fuel. You know they're going to get by you in the pit stop anyway. There's no point fi uh, fighting it out with him. Um, yeah, Moster could have fought with him. But why would he? It doesn't make any sense for Mostert to fight with Gisbergen. It's not his fight. So he let him go by. And he's not teammates with McLaughlin, so it doesn't matter. He has no horse in that race. Um, it's only Coulthard that, that, that interests me. Coulthard's actions do interest me. Especially since Mostert seemed to make it harder for Gisbergen to get around him than uh, Coulthard did. So, um, In fact, Coulthard lost time letting Luke Gisbergen through because he had to take the high, the high line up around turn six rather than taking the racing line. Um... I don't know, I'm sure they'll have talks about it internally, but it is interesting to see um, what's happening. Um, and they did interview him afterwards, and he just gave the usual 
the usual. I mean, the answer to basically that I just said he couldn't have held him up, so he let him through. Um, it seems like if if DJR didn't wasn't didn't tell him about this, it seems like they are not thinking about the championship that seriously at this stage. Like they think McLaughlin's either got it in hand and they're not worried about Shane, um, or they're just happy to let Fabian do his own thing. Um, either way, I think they need to be taking a bit of a harder look at what's going on because this stuff matters now. Um, and it did surprise me um, after it was pointed out to me, the significance of it. So um, we'll see what happens going forward. But anyway, now that we're finished with the results, let's go into the championship standings. So Scott McLaughlin and Shane Van Gisbergen separated by 131 points again exactly where they uh, were when they came into the round. So no changes there. Uh, what has changed, though, is the widening chasm between these two drivers and the rest of the field. 451 points back to Jamie Winkup from Scott McLaughlin, um, who is now in third. David Reynolds in fourth. Craig Lowndes in fifth, with exactly 500 points down. Coulthard in six, who's almost 200 points adrift from Craig Lowndes. So there's a big gap between fifth and sixth. Um, it's sort of their own real... First and second are really on their own. Um, McLaughlin and Gisbergen are really just on their own. Winkup, Reynolds, and Lowndes are on their own, in their own little island. Um, and then there's the rest of the field, basically. So Coulthard in sixth. Rick Kelly in seventh. Moster in eighth. Jumped a lot of positions with that with that. Two, with two excellent results from him. Um, Scott Pye still in ninth, just holding on. Um, Tim Slade back into 10th. Good to see him back up there. Nick Perkat dropped down, dropping down a few with some poor results. Um, as did James Courtney, who's in 12th. Garth Tander in 13th. Good to see him back up there a little bit more. Uh, Winterbottom in 14th. Caruso in 15th. Will Davis in the 16th, Waters in 17th, Heimgartner in 18th, Jack LeBrock, once again, the best of the rookies, after two good results, um, he's, I think, 5th in Tasmania, and uh, now a 10th in Queensland, he's now in 19th, so good job from him, he's 5 points ahead of Di Pasquale, <laughs> who's in 20th, so that's close, it'll be interesting to see which rookie does best, um, um, yeah, Holdsworth in 21st, uh, Di Silvestro in 22nd, James Golding in 23rd, Stanaway in 24th. Nice to see him not at the bottom of the table again. He doesn't deserve to be there, um, although he's not out by much, so he needs to be careful. Um, and Todd Hazelwood in 25th, and Tim Blanchard in 26th. And of course, Kirk Kostecki and Macaulay Jones, um, who, fun fact, Kostecki got more points than Macaulay Jones, so Kostecki's in 27th, and Macaulay Jones is in 28th. Um, for the constructors, the team's championships, Red Bull are in front, which I don't know if that was always the case. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't actually remember who was in front last time. Um, but whatever the case, the difference is only 87 points back to Shell. And if you need further proof of how far away these two teams are from everybody else... The next team is Walkinshaw Andretti United, Mobile One, Boost Mobile Racing, which is the longest name in the world, who are a full 1,245 points behind Red Bull, um, which is just over 1,100 points behind Shell. That's a lot. Um, it really is a two-horse race um, this year. It really is a two-horse race. Um, the next few teams are all in it together um so we've got walkinshaw followed by tickford the tickford cars of bottle and super cheap who would be nicely injected with a new fresh a new fresh set of points from Chas mostert's good results erebus who is just um reynolds and pasquale with now a 90 point penalty <laughs> because of just the uh d pasquale's um uh unsafe release i believe they were given more penalty a points penalty, and maybe you're fine for that. Um, so they're in fifth. Freightliner, which is um, BJR, in sixth. Um, Castrol Racing, blah, blah, blah. Um, Castrol Racing, and not blah, blah, blah. Castrol Racing and Plus Fitness Racing, um, which is Nissan Motorsport, basically. Uh, Rick Kelly and Caruso in seventh. Um, Wilson Security, which is Gary Rogers, uh, Garth Tander 
in Garth Tender and James Golding in eighth. Um, the other Nissan cars, um, Simona and Heimgartner in ninth. Lowndes all on his own in tenth. Um, Waters and uh, Stanaway in eleventh. Um, Milwaukee Racing, which is Will Davison in twelfth. Um, Jack LeBrock in thirteenth. Preston Hire, which is Lee Holdsworth in fourteenth. Big Mate, which is um, God Todd Hazelwood, that's him in fifteenth, and Team Cool Drive. Tim Blanchard in 16th position. So those are your championship standings going into the next round. Now we'll go over a bit of news. There's not a lot to talk about. Not a huge amount happened um, between the rounds or anything like that. Um, the only thing there is to talk about is, um, like I said, the aforementioned um, cool Tud letting through Shane Van Gisbergen, which I discussed. We also talked about um, Scott Pye and James Courtney's issues with each other on the first lap of the race. Um, obviously, the fingers being pointed every which way. Um, during the broadcast, James said basically point blank that Scott was to blame. It was his fault. Um, it seems like with post-race interviews, uh, Mark Winterbottom was on James's side. Um, he didn't seem to be particularly sore about it, which is weird because it sort of ended his race. But... Um, um, yeah, so it seems like Winterbottom and Courtney are sort of, you know, I'm especially Courtney are uh, saying that Pi is to blame, and Pi says that it's not his fault. Obviously, um, you know, you're never to blame <laughs> when you're a driver. Um, it's always someone else. Um, although it is interesting to see that to to see him say that he didn't. It says here, quote, "I pulled up alongside and braked beside his door, didn't lock a wheel or anything, and made the apex." I went across the apex curb and saw someone, Winterbottom, come across his front right wheel, and it th- and I think it broke his steering. The damage is on his front right. I was on his left. Um, so Scott's not even Scott's denying that he even made a mistake or even hit him, um, <laughs> um, which is interesting because he very clearly did hit him. Um, he hit Pi, hit Courtney into Winterbottom. That's what happened. Um, I, you know, I agree that it's a racing incident. No one should have been penalised for that. And they were. They weren't, sorry. Um, but whether or not you think it's Pye's fault or Courtney's fault or Winterbottom's fault for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, that is something that needs to be looked at in that team. Um, the other things that I wanted to talk about, um, I really wanted to talk about Van Gisbergen's unbelievable starts because, because we're going to put our conspiracy hat on um, I, I, I can't believe that he got such good starts twice in the weekend. And the reason why, this is an article that was posted before the Sunday race, is a, quote, creature comfort change to his car. Um, I, I don't know. He says, he's re, he, he says, quote, I was always good at starts in motocross and junior formula and at Stone Brothers. And really good at starts most of the time, he says. Uh, but since moving to Techno, I've been pretty, quote, shit. <laughs> the system that they, that they use is not to my liking, and I've never been able to use it. Uh, finally, the design office was free to make something I've wanted, and we fixed it. It's just a small tweak. It's creature comforts, and it's what you're used to. It seems to be working so far. I don't understand how a, quote, creature comfort could allow him to get such incredible starts over everybody else Um, because the thing is he says he's been shit at starting and yeah he hasn't been the greatest but he hasn't been getting bad starts um, at all he's I haven't seen him got a bad I've never seen him get a bad start um, recently not a terrible one like maybe he's dropped a position or two but he's never had a really bad start and he's he's had some good starts as well you know like he got the he got the jump on um wing cup at Townsville last round um but the starts that he got this weekend were incredible I just don't understand how something as simple as um as a creature creature comfort could change the in, the quality of his start so incredibly um yeah it's it's borderline it's been borderline conspiracy theory um enabling um, I imagine that there's some of you that are annoyed that he's, um, or at least if you're not a Red Bull fan or a, a Gisbergen fan, that you, it, um, 
that you can very easily blame things on uh, launch control, things like that. I don't think it's anything like that. There's nothing like that going on, of course. Um, but it does make me wonder what was changed. You know, it obviously doesn't say here because you can't just tell everybody how you get a good start. That, that would be silly. Um, but an amazingly good start and on both races does make me raise an eyebrow as to what happened. Um, as to what changed. Um, all we know is that he got a... That, he, that he's been shit since he moved to Techno, in his words. Um, which was... God, must have been four or five years ago now. Um, the thing that I don't understand is that they've un- he's been at Red Bull for... He was a champion at Red Bull in 2016. He's been in that team for two years. Two or three years now. And they only just fixed it. <laughs> they only just got around to fixing it. They only just got around to making one of their... Um, one of the top drivers in the sport feel better at racing, which is ridiculous. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's just a this year problem. Maybe it was good last year and the year before. Um, I don't know if it's just a this year thing, but that's the way things are. Um, he's had a creature creature comfort change, and now he's good at starting. So it'll be interesting to see if that carries over into the next race, because the next race is at. Um, hold on. Is at Sydney is the Sydney Super Night 300 at Sydney Motorsport Park. It will be under cover of darkness, under the lights, and it will only be one round, one race. Sorry. So practice one at night time, practice two during the day. Um, no practice three. There'll be uh, the, the three parts for qualifying um, because it's a shorter circuit. So part one. So if you do, um, if it's how it worked at Barbagello, it'll be practice two. The top ten drivers go through to um, practice uh, qualifying two immediately, um, and the top. Oh, I think it's like the top six from qualifying one get through to qualifying two. So that means there's sixteen drivers in qualifying two, and then that gets narrowed down to ten for qualifying three. And that determines the final order of the top 10. Um, interestingly, qualifying will be set. Um, they'll be held um, in sequence with each other. They'll also be held as the sun goes down. So um, that'll be interesting. Um, hopefully we don't get any issues with the sun in people's eyes. That sort of thing. And the race, which is taking place on Saturday. All this takes place on Saturday, by the way. Except for um, Friday night practice. Um, race 21 on Saturday um, at 7.20 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time until 9.40 p.m. Should be a good one. It'll be great to see these cars under cover of darkness again. Um, and when the cars come around to there, um, hopefully we'll see some changes. Hopefully we'll see if the Tickford cars have made some more improvements to their other cars. We see Mostert gaining more podiums. We'll see if Gisbergen is still as good at starting as he was here. We'll see if the Nissan cars have race pace at last. We'll see if Stanaway can um, continue to not drift around the course again and gain more positions. We'll see if LeBrock can continue his dominance of being of the rookie drivers. We will see all this and more in the next round of the V8 Supercars Championship at the Red Rooster Sydney Super Night 300. My name has been Kendall, and I will see you, or hear from you, or you'll hear me, at the next episode of the V8 Supercars fan cast. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.